The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His full and sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ the rock is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In part one and two of this episode, we began exploring several important questions and the answers to give us a better scriptural understanding of the topic of prayer. To date, we have asked and answered eight important questions, including 1. What is the proper biblical definition of the word prayer? 2. Are there any prerequisites necessary for a person to successfully pray? 3. Is there a selective mechanism God uses to answer prayer, or does God answer every prayer without regard? 4. Is there a formula to be found for successful prayer? 5. What, if anything, does prayer change? Does prayer change God's mind, or is it man who conforms his mind to God's? 6. If a prayer goes unanswered, does this mean that there is a problem with the person petitioning? 7. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? And finally, eight, is there any difference between private and public prayer? In the final installment of this episode, we continue by asking one additional question. Question nine, can prayer literally move a mountain? In several places in the New Testament, Scripture makes reference to praying, which if mixed with sufficient faith will quote-unquote move a mountain. We find the references in the following places. Matthew chapter 17 verse 20 references the disciples' unsuccessful attempt to cast out a demon. This verse says, quote, And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Unquote. Again, Matthew chapter 21, verses 21 and 22, references Jesus' curse causing the withering of a fig tree when it was not producing fruit. In this instance, the verse says, quote, 
Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do that which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive." Unquote. Again in Mark chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, which mention Peter's recounting of the withering of the same fig tree. In this verse, it says, quote, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them." Unquote. Luke chapter 17 verse 6 details the apostles' request for Jesus to increase their faith, saying, quote, And the Lord said, If ye have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Unquote. Finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, gives Paul's comments about the various gifts of the Spirit. Quote, and though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I have nothing." Unquote. Now given the above verses, God obviously places a great deal of emphasis on the importance and power of prayer. It is clear that God desires the earnest communion of our hearts and spirits through prayer to Him. Likewise, it is clear that God wants what is best in eternity for each believer. Finally, the above verses make it abundantly clear that faith plays a critical role to effective prayer. Unfortunately, as with so many other truths of God's Word, correctly teaching prayer with a biblical context has suffered greatly in past and present. Man's tendency to apply market philosophy to the Bible has given us misguided theology regarding prayer, resulting in name it and claim it, and blab it and grab it, and other similar teachings. In essence, these teachings basically say that people who are ostensibly believers have the ability to use the power of their faith as leverage to ensure that God answers prayer in a pre designated manner. In many, if not most cases, the prayers and questions have little or no regard as to whether or not what is being claimed is biblical, much less whether they are God's will for the petitioner. Perhaps worse yet, if the petitioner's prayers are not fulfilled, the implication, if not the outright accusation against the petitioner is that their prayer, their faith, or their relationship with God is somehow insufficient or lacking. Other approaches to prayer, such as, uh, for example, the prayer of Jabez, found in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9-10, through 10, take this and other verses and claim that there is some secret formula hidden by God for those who find it and or use it. Those who advocate such praying claim that by saying a set group of words, or by repeating the words a certain amount of times, places some mystical judo hold on God, which ultimately forces him to give in to the petition in question, and become, for lack of a better term, our butler. In some cases, the implication is that by knowing these secrets, one really has no need of God, that the request need not even be biblical only needed or wanted, and that the petitioner need not have a relationship with God in the sense that scripture would define it. Typically, the proof that such approaches are nothing more than marketing schemes is that the secret can only be divulged by paying money for a book, a video, a seminar, an audio recording which will teach you what the secret is and how to use it. Now, inevitably, every hoax based upon Scripture taken out of context has at its heart the presumption that the world of the here and now 
are or should be our primary concern. There is little, if any, attempt to place the tools of prayer, faith, and fasting and or God into eternal perspective against God's sovereign will. Those who teach the quote-unquote prosperity gospel rarely point out that God himself inspired the writer of Hebrews to write 40 verses in chapter 11 which go into great detail about specific historical biblical persons. These persons are deemed quote-unquote heroes of faith, yet verse 13 and verse 39 conclude in that chapter saying quote, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, unquote. The answer to why is not that they lacked faith, because God himself calls them heroes of faith. The why was not that they had not found the quote-unquote secret formula to prayer, or that they had an inadequate relationship with God. Instead, the people listed were heroes of faith because of their eternal perspectives, which are summarized in verses 13 through 16 of chapter 11. These verses say, quote, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city." Unquote. The earlier references to moving mountains and casting sycamore trees into the oceans are not literal statements which promise believers some kind of telekinetic powers from God. Instead, the use of such language has parallels in the teaching of the early rabbis. In that culture, quote-unquote, moving a mountain was a metaphor in Jewish literature for doing what was seemingly impossible. The mustard seed, for example, was the smallest seed commonly known to the people to whom Jesus was speaking. While the mustard seed was small, it becomes quite large, growing to the height of six feet or more. As a result, the ratio between the mustard seed and the fully grown mustard plant would be dramatic. The analogy between the planting, watering, sunlight, and consequent growth of the mustard seed and the growth of one's faith cannot easily be missed. Since Jesus' audience was Jewish, all these things would have been implicitly understood. So in context, what Jesus is saying is that only a grain of faith in God is necessary on the part of the believer for God to accomplish even the seemingly impossible when it is according to his sovereign will. It also occurs to me that whenever I think of having faith to quote-unquote move a mountain, I inevitably envision accomplishing or perhaps preventing some event or circumstances in the world outside myself. But how often do I stop to think that the quote-unquote mountain which God wants to move lies within me? Perhaps we all do well to begin our focus of prayer upon that mountain, that sin, that rebellion, that issue, whatever it might be that hinders our walk or displeases God before we concern ourselves with the cosmetics of life. In this sense, prayer is the tool we use to improve the quality and intimacy of our relationship with God. Prayer is the heavy artillery in the spiritual armor of God. However, we should not imagine that this artillery is for the purpose of bombarding or waging war against God to force Him to capitulate to our demands. Instead, prayer would better be thought of as an equilateral triangle consisting of prayer, faith, and God's will. By keeping each of these three in its proper perspective and priority, we find ourselves in the center, which is exactly where God intends that we should be. In conclusion, earlier, while answering question four, you will recall we asked whether there was a formula for successful prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13, and also in Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4, 
Jesus gives his blueprint and example for prayer. The preamble information to this prayer and the prayer itself confirm many of the principles discussed so far in this study. Although this prayer is often referred to as the Lord's Prayer, technically speaking, it is a prayer Jesus recommended to his followers. Quote, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to God which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Unquote. Let's look at this prayer itself, starting from verse 9, starting with the words, Our Father who art in heaven. First of all, the first two words, Our Father, assume and require a relationship between God and the one praying. Why is this important? Look at the example of an earthly father. When you ask your earthly father for some need, we assume you are on speaking terms with him and have a positive relationship. If so, he provides the need because he loves you and agrees with the reality of your need. You wouldn't think to go down the street and knock on some stranger's door and ask another person's father to meet your need. Why? Because you don't have a relationship with them. One cannot have true intimacy in conversation until both parties know each other well. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 demonstrates the gravity of the human dilemma by concluding, quote, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that understands. There is none that seeketh after God, unquote. We learn as a result that sin, which is present with every person, separates us from fellowship with God. The following verses demonstrate how any person can move from separation to the condition of fitting under the umbrella whereby we can say, quote unquote, our Father, as a result of the relationship with the Father. Romans chapter 3 verse 24 states, quote, we are justified freely by grace through redemption that is in Jesus Christ, unquote. Romans chapter 5 verse 2 says, quote, We are justified by faith, and we have peace, i.e. no more separation from God through our Lord Jesus Christ, unquote. Romans chapter 5 verse 3 states, quote, We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, unquote. Finally, Romans chapter 8, verses 10, 15, and 16 say that, quote, If Christ is in you, then we receive the spirit of adoption. We become the children of God with which we can say, Abba, Father, unquote. The next part of the verse says, Who art in heaven, or in the heavens. This is to say, our heavenly Father, or God the Father. If you have had the blessing to know and appreciate having had a relationship with an earthly father, then having confessed Jesus by faith through grace, you have the opportunity, access, and acceptance of your heavenly father. In this case, God the Father, who is a creator and sustainer of the universe, and who formed you and I in the womb, and who has a plan for your life. The next part of the verse says, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name is another way to say, cause your name to be set apart or sacred as an object of veneration. 
This points out that the first duty and outcome of a relationship and a restored fellowship with God through faith in Jesus Christ is to exercise a correct understanding and perspective of who God is and what he has done for you. This should naturally lead to fully and eternally giving all worship, honor, and praise, awe, respect, fear, love, worship, and so forth to God. Non-Christians and worldly Christians tend to glance straight over praising God and go straight to the wish list. The next part of the verse says, Thy kingdom come. This is actually a statement which flows from the believer's mindset, hope, and earnest desire in looking forward to the imminent return of Christ for his church and the establishment of his kingdom on earth. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8 says, quote, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at the last day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing." Unquote. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says, quote, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Unquote. The next part of the verse says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a statement which demonstrates submission of the believer's wants, wishes, and will to the perfect will of God for us in every situation of life. It is a simple phrase intended to correctly refocus the believer's perspective from the finite concerns of this world and this life to the eternal perspectives both now and tomorrow. We declare that God's will, purpose, and kingdom come before our own. We submit to God's will while we voluntarily forfeit our own will. Lastly, this statement is an acknowledgement and confession of the following. 1. God is in total control of every detail of the believer's life. 2. God's Spirit, i.e. the new nature, seeks and wills to find ways to mold and shape the believer into the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ, as found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. 3. Through God's indwelling spirit, I have his power and grace to flee the lusts of the flesh as well as the pursuits of the pride of life. 4. By his spirit, I understand that the two natures and wills are at war with one another. And finally, 5. The believer must constantly remain connected to Christ by faith and by grace crucify our old nature and will through Christ's death while infusing new life, a new nature, and the power of the Spirit through Christ's resurrection. The next part of the verse says, quote, Give us this day our daily bread. This verse tells the believer five things. 1. Since we are told only to pray for the current day's needs, this verse would imply that prayer is a daily necessity. 2. Our concerns and worries should not project beyond the needs of the day. 3. God knows intimately what our needs are. God also knows our wants. The ultimate issue is the reality of what wants or needs are according to God's purpose, plan, and will for our lives, as well as his overall plan for humanity. 4. As the believer grows in maturity and is progressively sanctified, we will see his track record. As a result, our trust should increase daily. This will have the effect of gradually outweighing or eliminating doubt and worry as we learn to lean on him. And finally, five, while the word our does initially imply that the petitioner is interceding for their own needs, the word our can also be used in a biblically correct context for the petitioner to intercede on behalf of anyone within the body of Christ. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says this, quote, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Unquote. Jesus comments on this issue thoroughly in Matthew chapter six verses twenty five through thirty four, which say quote, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than the meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. 
Are ye not better than they? Which of you taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things did the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof." The next part of the verse says, quote, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Unquote. The above statement incorporates an axiomatic truth about God's nature. When it comes to setting the standard, God has set the ultimate bar which cannot be surpassed. This fact is stated nowhere better than Romans chapter 8, verse 8, which says, quote, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Unquote. True ability to forgive, or lack thereof, is conditional to the implantation of the new nature through faith in and relationship with Jesus Christ. Our ability to forgive and extend grace to others is also directly proportional to our ability to fully appreciate the forgiveness and grace that God has extended to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Thus, the more our love and our appreciation for what God has done for us increases, the greater the ability to forgive others follows. Conversely, our desire or inability to forgive others creates barriers to greater sanctification and fellowship with God. Our insistence to hold grudges may presume some level of disbelief on our part in God's justice and or final judgment for unrepentant sinners or for those who have sinned against us. Finally, our inability or unwillingness to forgive others creates and stands as the very snare which can trap us and keep us from fully realizing forgiveness we need from God day to day. The next part of the verse says, quote, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Unquote. James chapter 1 verses 13 through 15 says, quote, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death." Unquote. This verse makes it clear that God is not the author of temptation. Rather, temptation comes about as a result of our own nature, of the world, and ultimately Satan. A better translation would be paraphrased, quote, let us not be tempted beyond what we are able to withstand, but deliver us from Satan." Unquote. This is supported by 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which says, quote, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it." Unquote. What we learn, therefore, from a correct context is that because of sin, the flesh, Satan, and the world, temptation is common to every human. The blessed distinction is that those who have a relationship with God will be victorious over temptation to the extent that they yield and submit themselves to God. The final part of this prayer says, quote, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Unquote. This verse focuses a correct perspective that all authority, dominion, power, glory, and honor emanate from God, and it is to God that all authority, dominion, power, glory, and honor return. A proper realization of the above should result in the natural praise and doxology of God. In the end, all things, all of the kingdoms of this world and in the world to come, belong to God. 
All power and all glory are due to him forever from all eternity. So be it. Father, we thank you that you have created us with the earnest desire and longing of your heart to have fellowship and communion with us. We thank you that by your grace we have access to you through faith in the completed work of your son Jesus. We thank you that by his sacrifice we are able to offer our petitions which are acceptable to you according to your will. We pray that the desire of our hearts would be to be conformed day to day, moment by moment, into the fullness and likeness and measure of the stature of your son Jesus, in whom you are well pleased. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. The world falls out.